Chapter 2. Breeding Mobs Almost a decade ago, and before Antifa was widely known and Black Lives Matter BLM was established, I wrote of mass movements in my book Ameritopia, in the framework of utopianism. Utopianism, whether in the form of Marxism, fascism, or some other form of autocratic statism, is alluring to many because, at their core, they make glorious claims of a paradisical future and the perfect ability of man. If only the existing society and culture are radically transformed or abandoned altogether, and the individual surrenders more of his liberty, free will, and security to the cause, such is the nature of mass movements. I explain further that mass movements attempt to devour the individual in two ways, consume his identity and uniqueness, thereby making him indistinguishable from the masses, but also assigning him a group identity based on race, age, income, etc., to draw class distinctions. Quote, this way, the demagogues and propagandists can speak to the well-being of the people as a whole while dividing them against themselves, thereby stampeding them in one direction to another as necessary to collapse the existing society or rule over a new one, end quote. And who among us is attracted to such mass movements? Again, as I noted, a receptive audience is found among the society's disenchanted, disaffected, dissatisfied, and maladjusted, who are unwilling or unable to assume responsibility for their own real or perceived conditions, but instead blame their surroundings, the system, and others. They are lured by false hopes and promises of utopian transformation and the criticisms of the existing society, to which their connection is tentative or non-existent. Improving the, mal the malcontents lot becomes linked to the utopian cause. Moreover, disbarring and diminishing the successful and accomplished becomes an essential tactic. No one should be better than anyone else, regardless of his merits or values of his contribution, by exploiting human frailties, frustrations, jealousies, and inequities, a sense of meaning and self-worth is created in the malcontents, otherwise unhappy and directionless lives. Furthermore, in mass movements, the individual is inconsequential as a person and useful only as an insignificant part of an agglomeration of insignificant parts. He is a worker, part of a mass, nothing more, nothing less. His existence is soulless. Absolute obedience is the highest virtue. After all, only an army of drones is capable of building a rainbow to paradise. Almost a century ago, the French philosopher and essayist Julien Bendon observed that mass movements form frequently around individuals who share the same political hatred. He wrote, Thanks to the progress of communication and still more to the group spirit, it is clear that the holders of the same political hatred now form a compact and passion mass, every individual of which feels himself in touch with the infinite numbers of others, whereas a century ago such people were comparatively out of touch with each other and hated in a scattered way. It may be asserted that these coherences will tend to develop still further, for the will of the group is one of the most profound characteristics of the modern world, which even in the most unexpected domains, for instance, the domain of thought, is more and more becoming the world of leagues, of unions, of groups. It is necessary to say that the passion of the individual is strengthened by feeling itself in proximity to these thousands of similar passions? The individual bestows a mystic personality on the association of which he feels himself a member and gives it a religious adoration, which is simply a defecation of his own per, uh, passion and no small stimulus to its intensity. Bandon also concluded that such movements are often cult-like. Quote, the coherence just described might be called a surface coherence, but there is added to it a coherence of essence, for the very reason that the holders of the same political passion form a more compact, impassioned group, they also form a more homogeneous, impassioned group in which the individual ways of feeling disappear and the zeal of each member more and more takes on that color of the others. Today, clearly, 
the Antifa movement is populated by indistinguishable soldiers dressed uniformly in black and face coverings. Their identities and names are unknown. They are indoctrinated in a Marxist anarchist ideology trained in violence and said to be an idea. Obviously, it is more than an idea. It is a dangerous and brutal movement populated by angry zealots. BLM is also a Marxist anarchist movement. However, it has self-identified as a black power or black liberation movement, when in fact, its agenda extends well beyond race into the usual Marxist demands for the destruction of the existing society. Of course, these movements, like all mass movements, cannot tolerate or survive competing or rival ideas or voices. They demand groupthink and conformity. We have even seen this orthodoxy spread throughout our culture with the widespread firming, shaming, banning, intimidating, and otherwise abusing those who dare to voice contrary or different views or questions or challenge, for example, BLM's mission. So ubiquitous is this assault on individual and nonconformism in today's society that it has acquired its own modern nomenclature, the cancel culture. However, this is not new, just more prevalent, open, and intense. Again, I wrote nearly a decade ago that these mass movements are intolerant of diversity, uniqueness, debate, etc. For their purpose requires a singular focus. There can be no competing voices or causes slowing or obstructing society's long and righteous march. They rely on deceit, propaganda, dependence, intimidation, and force. In its more aggressive state, as the malignity of the enterprise becomes more painful and its impossibility more obvious, it incites violence in as much as avenues for free expression and civil dissent are cut off. Violence becomes the individual's primary resource and the state's primary response. Ultimately, the only way out is the state's termination. Thus, mass movements rely significantly on indoctrination and brainwashing. They are ignited and motivated by an enthusiastic intelligentsia or experts professionally engaged in developing and spreading utopian fantasies. They are immune from the impracticality and consequences of their blueprints, for they rarely present themselves for public office. Instead, they seek to influence those who do. They legislate without accountability. Where are these experts found? As we shall see, primarily among tenured faculty in our colleges and universities whose intellectual and emotional fealty are mostly aligned, at least in significant part, with the ideological prescriptions of Jean Jacques Rousseau, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, and of course, Karl Marx. Rousseau, Heigl, and Marx, in their own ways, argue for the individual subjugation into the general will or greater good or bigger cause built on radical egalitarianism, that is, the collective. Of course, as logic, reason, and experience demonstrate, this is a building block for totalitarian causes and regimes. As the state becomes increasingly authoritarian and despotic, controlling speech, mobility, and even thought where possible, it is said to perpetuate and celebrate a kind of popular or people-oriented will and liberation. To better understand the uh, philosophical underpinnings of the Antifa, BLM, and similar anti-American movements, let us take a brief look at Rousseau, Hegel, and Marx in this context. Rousseau explained, I conceive of two kinds of inequality in the human species. One I, that I call natural and physical, because it is established by nature and consists in the difference of age, health, body, strength, and qualities of mind and soul. The other may be called moral or physical inequality, because it depends on a kind of convention and is established, or at least authorized, by the consent of men. This latter type of inequality consists in the different privileges enjoyed by some at the expense of others, such as being richer, 
more honored, more powerful than thine, or even causing themselves to be obeyed by them. Rousseau argued further that if we follow the progress of inequality in the history of governing systems, we will find that the first stage was the establishment of the law and of the right of property. The second stage was the institution of magistracy. And the third and final stage was the transformation of legitimate power into arbitrary power. Thus, the condition of rich and poor was authorized by the first epoch, that of the strong and weak by the second, and that of the master and slave by the third, the ultimate degree of inequality and the limit to which all the others finally lead until new revolutions con uh, completely dissolve the government or bring it nearer to a legitimate institution. How will we know when the legitimate institution has been achieved beyond the theoretical construct? Rousseau does not tell us. For Heigl, the individual finds his actualization, liberty, happiness, fulfillment, through the state, but not just any state. States evolve over time, ultimately leading to a fully developed state, or the final end. In such a state, the individual becomes part of a universalized collective whole. That which preceded the final end is of no consequence. Again, the individual is subservient to the state for both his own realization and the greater good of the collective. At this point, the state as a completed reality is the ethical whole and the actualization of freedom. It is the absolute purpose of reason that freedom should be actualized. The state is the spirit which abides in the world and there realizes itself consciously. Only when it is present in consciousness, knowing itself as an existing object, is it the state. In thinking of freedom, we must not take our departure from individuality or the individual self-conscious, but from the essence of self-consciousness. Let man be aware of it or not, this essence realizes itself as an independent power, in which particular persons are only phrases, the state is the march of God in the world. Its ground or cause is the power of reason realizing itself as well. How do we know when we have reached the final end beyond the theoretical construct? Heigl does not tell us. Marx, with his emphasis on historical materialism, wrote, the modern bourgeoisie society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with the class antagonisms. Society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other. Bourgeoisie, the capitalists, the owners of property and the means of production, and proletariat, labor the industrial worker class. Marx argues that not only are the proletariat slaves of the bourgeois class and the bourgeois state, they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine, by the overseer, and above all, the individual bourgeois manufacturer himself. Consequently, the proletariat's fate is at a dead end, unless, of course, he adopts the revolution prescribed by Marx. It is the only way out. If the proletariat is to eliminate economic classes and transform society into an egalitarian paradise, he must wipe clean the present from the past. First, by overthrowing the existing regime and smashing capitalism, replacing them with a centralized proletariat state, and once society and the culture are cleansed of the past, the state will wither away, and what follows is an amorphous utopian state powered by the people through the collective. As Marx declares, of course, in the beginning, this cannot be effected except by means of despotic inroads on the rights of, of property and the conditions of the bourgeois production, by means and measures, therefore, which appear economically insufficient and untenable. 
but which in the course of the movement outstrip themselves, necessitate further inroads upon the old social order, and are unavoidable as a means of entirely revolutionizing the mode of production.